Shabbat Shalom. Good Friday morning. I'm so glad to be here. Excited. It's just an exciting time of the year for me. Uh, today's first full day of fall started yesterday at 9.21 a.m. At least that's what they tell us. And uh, news this morning is telling us that next week we're going to have some weather in the 50s. Down in the 50s. That'd be high 50s, I think they, they were saying, if I remember correctly, for, for the lows. But we're getting to the point of time of the year where I can go out now and, and build my fire in the fire pit out there behind the house, the pasture at night, sit around there with a glass of wine and just with my dog and my horses and just watch the stars and the heavens. And I'm telling you, I love this time of the year. And, uh, and yes, I do drink wine. If you heard that. Yes, I do. Uh, it may surprise some of you. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not going to do that teaching today, but as a matter of fact, years ago, it was when, when I was a young pastor in the Baptist church 40 years ago, this idea that drinking was a sin and that uh, that that wine was of the devil, and I'm reading the scripture and seeing that Yeshua turned water into wine, and but people said no, that was grape juice. That was the first thing I started. I said this is insanity, <laughs> and that's that's one of the things that got me to search in scripture outside of denominational teaching and what Christianity had uh, had had typically taught, and it opened a door to me that I'm, I'm still going through and discovering uh, that I've got to put so much out of my head that I've been taught by Christianity and, and Christian theology that's just not in the Word of God. But that's not my deal today. <laughs> but I'm not in telling you that you need to drink wine. That's your business if you choose not to. But it's, it, it's nowhere in Scripture taught that it's a sin. That is, uh, that is that's crazy. Anyway, anyway, uh, I want to tell you, so Shabbat Shalom, sundown today, will begin the Sabbath. And I'm excited about our services at B'nai Israel tomorrow. And again, as always, I want to invite anybody that's listening. If uh, if you're just if you want to come and visit with us, we would love to have you. We'll begin our services at 10:30 tomorrow morning, 9,000 East Kings Highway, University Worship Center, where the old Barn Dinner Theater used to be. Some of you may be old enough to remember that. Uh, it was University Baptist Church, and uh, now we have B'nai Israel meeting there. It would love to have you come and meet with us. It's an exciting time of the year. We're getting ready now to observe the fall feast. Uh, we've got the Feast of Trumpets, and then uh, uh, 10 days after that, we'll have Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and then five days uh, following that, we'll have Sukkot. And, uh, in fact, we're getting ready now to start building our booths, our sukkah booths, uh, that uh, we will take meals in, and, and we commemorate uh, the fact that it's remembering of the, of the wilderness wandering and the fact that God will again tabernacle with his people. And it's just exciting when the Bible becomes a real book. And I was talking to one of my men yesterday that, that it's exciting when it's, it's, not, it's something real that you live out in your life and, and, and not just a bunch of words that you believe in like you believed in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, the Easter Bunny. But anyway, it's an exciting time, and I'm, I'm excited about it. Yesterday we were talking about uh, the seven churches in Revelation and, and, uh, and my position on those. Now, I want to say that I know that some of you are saying, Steve, you are, you're, you're saying things that I have never heard in all of my life about the church and about us keeping the commandments. And, and when I said yesterday that the seven churches of Revelation uh, were, is a picture of the Gentile churches, that is, formerly Gentiles who were supposed to be grafted into Israel and were supposed to, in this period of time, uh, provoke the Judah, the Jews, to jealousy and to be a testimony to them that Yeshua HaMashiach the one they call Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. Well, the church has miserably failed at that nearly 2,000 years now, and we have not been able to provoke the Jewish nation to jealousy. Uh, and it's because of, of what John was showing us here that the Messiah showed to him was the, the gradual decline and degradation of, of what Christ wanted the Gentile church to be, how we end up in the Laodicean church just totally ineffective, uh, thinking that we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and do not even know that we're blind, wretched, miserable, poor, and naked. Uh, and that's where the church is today. And, and so I, now I know that that is, you say, preacher, I ain't never heard another preacher say that in all my life. Well, part of, part of what I've had to do, and as if you've listened to the early teachings, and by the way, Rick Cochran, who, who works with me, and, and bless his heart, he, he does a great job in trying to edit these things and, 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 and get them up. They have to be converted from an audio file to a video file to go up on YouTube, and, 
and it's been taking him a while to do that. But he tells me he thinks he's going to have all of my teachings up uh, possibly by the end of this weekend. And so you can go to ShreveportMessianics.com and uh, con- go to the contact section and leave a message for me if you want to. Uh, but there's also, uh, you can you can find our YouTube contact with all the teachings that I've done there. And uh, But if you go back on those, you'll know that I've, I've, I've said in early teachings that uh, in 1985, uh, which is about uh, uh, 31 years ago, I walked away from the church totally. Uh, I, I was so discouraged at Christianity, and, and, and I'd looked at all denominations. After I, got, after I saw that Baptists were so messed up in a lot of the things they taught, I looked at other denominations, see if, if there was one that's out there true, and I found that they're all blind leaders of the blind, and that's why they, they're all in a ditch. And so I walked away from it and was away from it for many, many years. Not walking away from God, I just, I just walked away from religion because I saw religion was uh, uh, being used primarily just to control people and, and, and truth was really irrelevant. It was all about money and about control. And, uh, and, and we're still seeing that today. But, so I know that a lot of things I'm saying are different than anything you've ever heard, but there's a reason that they're different. It's because I was able to walk away from, uh, after over 10 years of, of intense study, uh, and, and I might say success in, in Christianity, I was able to walk away from it then and begin to sort out and to look with fresh eyes at everything the Scripture says, and to take it in context, taking the macro view from Genesis to Revelation, trying to understand what this book was talking about, and understanding, approaching it from the point that there's no contradiction once we understand what our Father has told us, and what Yeshua told us, and what the life He lived, and also what the apostles lived and what they taught us. There is no contradiction in it. And if you approach the Scripture from that way, from Genesis to Revelation, and if you see a supposed contradiction or a place where God must have changed his mind and went from plan A to plan B or even plan C, then you've got to back up and realize you have missed something, that you are the one that's wrong. It's not the Scripture. And so when you can, when you can do that and step back and, and, and make it come together without any contradiction, letting God be true and every man a liar, and I don't care what denomination he came from or what seminary he graduated from, God is true. Every man is a liar that contradicts what the Father has said. And so uh, when I tell you that if, if you look at, at uh, the seven churches as showing the decline of what we call uh, Christianity, and it is a miserable failure, but there is hope there. I, I don't want you to be discouraged in that because God is calling his people out. We can have revival today, but we've got to hear the Messiah calling us out of, of the Laodicean age of the church. It's, it's, it's the most exciting time for you to be alive as a preacher or a teacher or, or a layperson to begin to walk in truth. And so we want to look at, uh, at John. If you see the setting of this, why was John on the Isle of Patmos? Why was he there to begin with? Now, this is the John who wrote, you know, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And if you'll go back and read those, uh, it, it's amazing if you'll just read them with fresh eyes and believe what you're reading instead of... Uh, having it filtered through your denominational theology, it's amazing what you'll see there. But John, in, uh, and, and I'm just going to uh, highlight a couple of things. John, in, uh, in 1 John, in 2.3, he said uh, that uh, we know him if we keep his commandments. In 2.4, he said, Keepeth those that keep not his commandments are a liar, and the truth's not in them. In 3.22, he said, Because we keep his commandments. 3.24, He that keepeth uh, his commandments dwelleth in him. 5.2 said, uh, When we love God, we keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 3 says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Uh, so in verse 5, 3 says, and his commandments are not grievous. That is, they're not hard to obey. And so uh, uh, 2 John 2, 1, 1, 6 says, and this is love, that we walk after his commandments. So we see over and over again, John is one who was keeping the commandments of God and, and emphasized that we are to walk in obedience to his commandments. Now it's interesting that in 3 John, we see that, that John, the apostle here, is put out of the, of the church uh, because of the Word of God. In, uh, in, in 3 John, there was a guy that, uh, by the name of Theotrephes that he said put him out. Uh, 
and I'm not I'm not going to go deep into third John because for for time here because I I get out of time so quick. But uh, in in third John, uh, in verse seven, John says, "Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth." Now, always understand, you've got to get your definition of terms down. I've went over this before. Anytime you hear the word truth, it is Torah, straight from the, from the, from the lips of the Messiah himself in John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now, look at verse 9. John says, I wrote unto the church, the ecclesia, a synagogue, but the author of these, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. Wherefore, if I come... I will remember his deeds, which he doth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren. Now, brethren, you got to define that term. Who are the brethren? Again, straight from the lips of Messiah himself. In Luke chapter 8, who is my mother and my brother and my sisters? Those who hear the word of God and do it. The same is my mother and my brother and my sister. So, John says that the authors wouldn't receive the brethren. That, that's those that are obeying the word of God, keeping the commandments. So we're seeing that already at this time, this, this mystery of iniquity that Paul had talked about, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, is already creeping into the church. The mystery of, that, that people would not have to keep the commandments of God, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. This was already happening, and I want you to get that picture. Uh, so important, if you're going to understand what God's trying to do today. And so he says that the Diotrephes wouldn't receive him, and he wasn't content there in verse 10. He said he wasn't content with there, but uh, that neither doth he receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would. That is, there were some there that would have received the brethren, those that were uh, walking in obedience to God's commands, but he, he prevented them as well and cast them out of the church. So this was already taking place, this ungodliness that we see uh, with the Greek and Roman influence coming in and taking the preeminence, that is the leadership of the church. And so as the apostles died out, John, a faithful one standing for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, then this Greek Roman influence crept in. And that's what we see in the seven churches of Revelation is how it steadily declined into the ungodly uh, organization we see today called Christianity that Christ says makes him want to vomit. That I'll spew you out of my mouth. Now, looking at this, you, you see the history. This, this, it wasn't something that, that newly started. John, in, in the Revelation in chapter 1, uh, why was John on the Isle of Patmos? And he tells us in verse 9, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother, who is your brother? Those who keep the word of God. <laughs> you, once you begin to see this, it's everywhere, friends. Your brother and companion in tribulation. Wait a minute. I thought tribulation was going to start 2,000 years later. No, 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 no. What I want you to understand, we have been in the last days for the last 2,000 years. We've totally misunderstood the book of Revelation, and as I say, due to the the, the replacement theology and the theological gymnastics that Christians went through trying to understand why we don't have to keep God's commandments. It's just amazing. But John said, your, your, your companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Yeshua HaMashiach was in the isle that is called Patmos. Now, why was he in, if I can tell you, why was he in the isle called Patmos? For the word of God and the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. He was there, banished to the Isle of Patmos, because he was wanting to keep the Word of God, the Torah, and the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. So, I want to back up chapter 1 a little bit. This is not really uh, what I'm saying today, but I want you to understand John, in chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto him unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Oh, wait a minute. Must shortly come to pass? Surely that's got to be a mistake. Because we're still waiting for it to start after the church is raptured out of here in the next year or two, and we start the seven-year period of tribulation. But John said, 
Christ showed him those things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. You think Jesus was mistaken? That he didn't understand? Maybe he's mistaken like he was in, in Matthew 5, 17 through 20 when he said that he didn't come to destroy or change the law and the prophets but to fully preach them. And the preacher's been telling us he did, even though that's what he said. Same thing here. Christ said it's going to shortly come to pass. It's not going to wait 2,000 years. Verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach and of all things that he saw. Now, we, we see that John is talking about him being your brother in tribulation. So again, I, I just want you to begin to look at the book of Revelation with fresh eyes. Step back, try to forget everything you've ever been taught about it, and just let the word say what it says. Try to understand it in context. But uh, don't, uh, uh, don't spiritualize it, but try to understand that, that uh, we are already in the tribulation and the seven churches or the histories I showed you yesterday the last 2,000 years. And, uh, and so it started in Ephesus. The first church was, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, John wrote to, or Christ uh, wrote to through John, John told us about was the church at Ephesus. Why is that important? Paul spent two years in Ephesus. Uh, about nine years ago, I was in Ephesus. Uh, I went with uh, uh, my youngest two children, Victoria Scarlett and Stephen Forrest Rainey. We, uh, uh, we, this wasn't a spiritual trip. At this time, like I say, I was out of the church. I, I, I was totally out of anything to do with religion, but I've always studied and I've always been interested in trying to separate the truth uh, I've looked at Christianity as, as like a huge uh, garbage dump or landfill uh, of 2,000 years of people pouring crap into it. And I've always known that the truth is in there. It's just buried under all this false doctrine and, and traditions of men. And we've got to be willing to dig through there, through all the trash and the nasty, stinking stuff, to try to find the truth. And that's what I did for 30 years. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's not pleasant. But if you want the truth bad enough, you will dig through that crap and find it. It's in there. It's just buried under the traditions of men. And uh, uh, this is what we're, we're trying to dig out here. So I was in that stage at that time uh, and in the wilderness, as, as so to speak. So when I, went, when I went to Ephesus, it wasn't only spiritual uh, pilgrimage, but, but those things had always been in my heart. Actually, it was a business trip that uh, one of the companies that I worked with uh, took us on, and uh, we flew to Rome. Uh, from Rome, we went down to the coast and boarded a ship and sailed from there to uh, Greece. We toured Greece, uh, and uh, I was able to, to share that with my youngest children, uh, uh, to go to, through Greece, the Apocrypha, to stand on Mars Hill where the Apostle Paul preached, uh, experienced those things, and we went to the Greek island of Santorini, a uh, beautiful, beautiful place I'd love to go back to. And then, and then after that, we boarded ship again and went to Turkey. And uh, I forget the name of the little town we landed in, uh, uh, but it wasn't far uh, from Ephesus. And so we went by bus up to Ephesus, and uh, we spent the day there. Uh, amazing to walk through the ruins of Ephesus and to see the, the, uh, the amphitheaters and the synagogue and and all, and to know that the Apostle Paul himself spent two years there forming and establishing that church in Ephesus. But what we see in Revelation is that they left their first love, and their first love was Torah. That's what Paul uh, established with them, and, and the church went down from there. Now, what Christianity has taught us, and this is going to be a... Uh, I'm telling you, it's a game changer. You've really got to back up and rethink everything that you've been taught, and especially those of you who are believing in a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, you've been taught that after uh, Revelation 3, where Christ said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and he's calling, as I said yesterday, he's calling people out of this system that the church became. It's not what he established, but it's what men did to it, what the Greek-Roman influence did. And we were warned about this over and over and over again by Peter, Paul, James, Jude, Christ himself warned that this was going to happen. And uh, so now he's calling, 
his people out of that. And when I say that he's calling you to come out of the, the mystery Babylon, and, and that's I'm talking about the system. I'm not talking about you leaving your church building. I'm not talking about you leaving the physical structure that you call your church. Uh, stay there. You, you built those. You poured a lot of money into it. Don't walk away from that, but take it and reclaim it for the kingdom. Let's go to our leadership, and if you're in leadership, go to your congregation. Let's say, look, let's turn back to the word of God and the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, because it is spirit and truth. This is what the Messiah established, and it's what the way the, the, way the, the, the ecclesia, the church, is going to end up, the true church, and I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. I want you to be a part of the true church. I want you to, I, I want you to enjoy the, the thrill that comes when you understand. Uh, well, first of all, you've got to get over the anger of having been deceived. I, I went through that for a long period of time, and, and it, it's frightening and it's scary when you understand, God, we believe lies and, and, and doctrines of men, seducing spirits and devils. That scares you and it frightens you. But once you get past that, and see the joy and the beauty of the, and the truth of God's Word, it will absolutely change your life. And that's what I want for you. I want it for every denomination. Uh, because there are good people in all of them that love the one they call Jesus. They just don't know Him. They think He changed the law. He changed the Sabbath and, and did away with His Father's instructions. And, and, and that is a lie of the devil. You did not willingly fall into that. That's what we've been taught, been handed down from one to another and another. But what I wanted to see in the beginning is it started with John. It was already starting, and Paul told us in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. And that word iniquity there, you can look it up in your Strong's Concordance. It's the same word that Yeshua used in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Matthew 24, uh, verse 12, I believe it is, where he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That is lawlessness, transgression of the Torah. Same word Paul used in Second Thessalonians 2 for the mystery of iniquity, lawlessness, Torah breaking, is already being taught as it work. And it's the exact same word Yeshua used in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when he said, I will say unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Because he said, I never knew you. That is, ye that don't uh, follow Torah or my Father's commandments. And, and God, I, I cannot tell you how I wish you could see this, that the scales would fall from your eyes and you begin to see the beauty of our Father's Word and of His plan, but also understand the subtleness of Satan and what a deceiver he is if he can get us off of the Word of God uh, and, and get us to walking in, in the vanity of our own minds and our flesh. So John is on the Isle of Patmos because of the Word of God and the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach. Now, the church has told me when I went in 40 years ago, and I used to preach this as a, as a young Baptist preacher. I've got to tell you, I have repented. I have asked God to forgive me, and I believe that He has. But I used to preach a pre-tribulation rapture. I used to preach that, that uh, as, as the preachers taught me in chapter, uh, after uh, chapter 3, uh, they would say verse chapter uh, 4, verse 1 says, after this, and what they was after this, this is after the church age, is what they would say. After the church, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice I heard was of a trumpet talking with me. He said, come up hither, and I will show you the things which must be hereafter. Now, and, and everybody said, that was the rapture of the church right there. That was John, because Paul tells us, trumpet of sound will be changed. And so that's it right there. That was the, that was the rapture of the church. And what they would tell us is that, and that, proved that doctrine that they taught. I'm convinced it's a doctrine of devils and seducing spirits. But they would prove that by saying that the church is not mentioned again throughout the book of Revelation. You won't find the word church again in the book of Revelation. And, and I bought into that doctrine. because it, it seems plausible if you, if you, if you listen to their, uh, to their thinking. But what we have to understand is the reason that the church, as they talk about the Gentile church, what it had become is not mentioned again in the book of Revelation, is because, as Yeshua had just said, it made him vomit. He's vomited it out of his mouth. It is irrelevant. What he is doing now is calling, but he's got some of his sheep that are in that system, and he's calling them to come out to where he is. Come out of Torahlessness. 
come out of, of the system of the Antichrist, the Antimessiah, and come out where he is and walk in obedience to him. That's called revival. It's called to live again. So when they say that the church is not mentioned again in the book of Revelation, I want to show you that's just not true. Uh, what you have to do is, is change your thinking and your understanding of what the true church is. And I, I wish I had more time to deal with each one of those seven churches and show you. Uh, the, and as I said yesterday, though, you can, you can go back in history, if you know history, and you can see the things that have happened uh, over the past 2,000 years and, and see which one of those churches represented a period in history. But uh, right now I want you to see that uh, the church is mentioned throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. It's just not in a way that you've been taught to understand it. Uh, in, uh, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, And the dragon was wrought with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, did you hear that? This is the, the, the war that's been going on. This has been going on for the last 2,000 years now. Uh, it, I won't go back to, I wish I had time to take chapter 12 on, uh, but this, uh, uh, it, it's Israel that brought us the seed, the Messiah, and Satan has been making war with her for the last 2,000 years, trying to destroy Israel. God has protected her. And, and the church is, the true church is, are those that are the remnant, they're the seed of this woman, Judah. Salvation is of the Jews, Christ told us in John chapter 4. And the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the true church, and it is here. And we find it again in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Not Christians, saints. That's, a, that's another message. I'll get to it. Uh, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, Yeshua. You see this over and over again. So the church is still here. It's just not that, that church that has, has declined into all kind of pagan, ungodly doctrine that is nothing like what the Messiah established and showed us to walk in nothing like it it's here though and i will i'll turn it over because i'm out of time here in revelation chapter 22 verse 14 blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city the church is here i want you to be part of that church i want you to be part of the true church of messiah I want you to hear him calling you out of the traditions and, and, and doctrines of men. I want you to hear him calling you into truth, which is Torah. Take that first step. Have the courage to say you're just going to follow what the Scripture says and you're going to reject the teaching of men. Let God be true and every man a liar. I'm telling you, I think revival could come to this country. Can you imagine if... If we get a leader in this country that can tear down the political system and ungodliness up there, and at the same time we get Christianity to turn back to the Word of God, oh, what a revival we could have in this country. I'm out of time. Shabbat shalom. I'll see you Monday morning, Lord willing. Shalom alaikum.